I find it uh, a difficult time to be a, a Catholic, and I want to say a word about the present situation. I find it's a difficult time to be a Catholic and a great time in different senses. It's very difficult because um, now, as you know, there's a terrible crisis rocking the Catholic Church, and I just wanted to say a word about that. And in this time, I actually feel closer to people of the Islamic faith than I ever have before, because following September 11th, it seemed as if the entire Muslim community was under a cloud, when really it was actions, terrible actions, of course, but the actions of just a few people. And in this crisis, too, Catholic, the Catholic Church and Catholic priests are under this dark cloud, even though less than 2% uh, of priests have ever been involved in any sort of sexual wrongdoing, according to sociological statistics. And nevertheless, it is a time in which we need to take stock. We need to take stock, as the Islamic community did, in terms of trying to uh, deal with people with extreme views who want to use violence to solve their views, and in the Catholic Church as well, to deal with people with deep psychological and social problems. Mm -hmm. But I feel very close to the Islamic community now because I feel that the Islamic community was suffering after September 11th in a way, and now the Catholic community is suffering. But I also feel a sense of hope, and I feel a sense of hope because after September 11th, many people became much more interested in Islam and learning about that great faith tradition. And I hope the same thing will happen with the Catholic Church, that people will come to recognize that the actions of a few should not taint the entire uh, institution as a whole. Now, with that being said, I want to speak today about interest in the Catholic tradition. Now, like all its teachings, the Catholic, teachings church, uh, the Catholic Church's teaching on interest arises out of a fundamental belief that faith and reason are compatible. Faith is not opposed to reason, and true reasoning is not opposed to faith. John Paul II recently wrote an encyclical letter to all Catholics called Fides et Ratio. That's Latin for faith and reason. And in it he said this, that faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. And God has placed in the human heart a desire to know the truth, in a word, to know himself. So that by knowing and loving God, men and women may also come to the fullness of truth about themselves. Now we find this complementary, complementarity of faith and reason also at work in the Catholic Church's treatment of money and related matters like charging interest. Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, in the 19th, 13th century, rather, the great philosopher and theologian Thomas Aquinas made the same point, using an analysis derived from Aristotle, a Greek philosopher. And what he said is that wealth, although good, cannot be seen as the greatest good. Wealth is only a means, and so it should be used in the service of the human person and not to degrade or undermine in any way the human person. Within this context, one should understand the teaching of the Catholic tradition. Understanding this teaching and understanding the relationship of its past articulation to its present formulation is no easy task. I thank Professor John Goldengay, who has made my task much easier by already addressing various passages in both the New and Old Testaments that relate to lending money at interest and usury. Let me continue where he left off with the writings of the early leaders of the Christian community, commonly called the Fathers of the Church. Usury is condemned by all fathers of the church, both, both in the East and in the West. St. Ambrose, St. Jerome, St. Augustine, Pope St. Leo the Great, as well as bishops meeting in church councils. This is one quotation from a church council, the Second Lateran Council, that met in 1139. It reads as follows. Furthermore, we condemn that practice accounted despicable and blameworthy by divine and human laws, denounced by scripture in the Old and New Testaments, namely the ferocious greed of users, and we sever them from every comfort of the church, forbidding any archbishop or bishop or any abbot of any order, whatever, or anyone in clerical orders, that is, priests, to dare to receive users lest, unless they do so with extreme caution. But let them be held infamous throughout their whole lives, and unless they repent, be deprived of a Christian burial." Several popes also condemned usury, including Alexander III, Gregory IX, Urban III, Innocent III, and Clement V. Now, these views were not taken to be anything unique to the Catholic tradition. Thomas Aquinas, 
commentary is, Thomas Aquinas in his famous Summa Theologiae wrote this, Moreover, the philosopher Aristotle, led by natural reason, says in the politics that to make money by usury is exceedingly unnatural. Now, usury was held to be wrong, not simply on account of motivation, though characteristically, usury was linked with vices such as avarice. John Finnis, in his magisterial book on Thomas Aquinas, notes that St. Thomas did not view making money as inherently wrong. It would be wrong to make money simply for the sake of making money, as if money were the final end, but Thomas held that there was nothing objectionable in itself with making money for the sake of sustaining a household, helping the poor, or for public benefit. Nor is trading in itself wrong. The price of an item is fixed by the market demand for the product, so long as both buyer and seller are aware of the product's merits and defects. The seller may not, however, take advantage of the need of the buyer. A just price is, according to Finnis' understanding of Aquinas, when all parties in the transaction are, as far as possible, compensated proportionately for what they give up. Now, Aquinas believes that usury contradicts justice and is therefore incompatible with the happiness of a virtuous person in this life or the perfect happiness of someone in the life to come in heaven. Here's what he says. To take usury for money lent is unjust in itself because this is to sell what does not exist, and this evidently leads to inequality, which is contrary to justice. In order to make this evident, we must observe that there are certain things the use of which consists in their consumption. Thus, we consume wine when we, drink, when we use it for drink, and we consume wheat when we use it for food. Wherefore, in such things, the use of the thing must not be reckoned apart from the thing itself. And whoever is granted the use of the thing is granted the thing itself, and for this reason, to lend things of this kind is to transfer the ownership. Accordingly, if a man wanted to sell wine separately from the use of wine, he would not be selling the same thing twice. He would be selling what does not exist. Wherefore, he would evidently commit a sin of injustice. On like manner, he commits an injustice who lends wine or wheat and asks for double payment, namely, one, the return of the thing in equal measure, and the other, the price of use, which is called usury. Now, what is Aquinas getting at in this passage? It seems sort of uh, difficult, perhaps, to understand at first glance. The distinction he's drawing is between the use of the thing and the thing in itself. Now, some things are destroyed in their very use. In other words, to drink wine is to destroy the wine. It is no longer available for others. But other things, you can lend out the use of the thing without destroying the thing, like, say, a house, which can be returned in good, in good order. Since money on this model is a thing consumed in its use, to charge a person interest on a loan is to demand payment for selling the money, the principal, and another payment for renting the money, interest. As Finnis notes, to make any further change in respect of a loan of money is unjust, and to the name of this sort of charge, this sort of wrong, is usury. For, as we saw, in making a loan of this sort, I willy-nilly transfer ownership and thus risks of loss along with use. The two cannot be separated. To transfer the one is to transfer the other. And to use a thing of this sort is to consume it, that is, to lose both possession and ownership of it, either by transfer to someone else, as in the case of money as such, or by destruction of the thing lent, as in the case of bread and wine. Justice in exchange can be understood as an equality between what is given on both sides of the exchange. So if someone lends amount X, then in justice, the borrower must repay amount X, no more and no less. To demand more is to be unjust. Now, the contemporary church does not abide by this teaching. As John Noonan notes, a famous historian of usury, by 1750, the scholastic theory and the counter theory, approaching the same problem from different theoretical viewpoints, agree in approving the common practice of demanding interest on a loan. As time went by, the majority of respected theologians approved of making interest on loans, and the Holy Office did not condemn the practice. In 1917, canon law actually required Catholic institutions, such as hospitals, schools, and universities, to invest their assets profitably. Now, what happened between Thomas Aquinas and the contemporary teaching? What, what went on? Well, this is not a quotation from Thomas Aquinas. Does anyone know where this comes from? This is a short poem from one of my favorite poets, Emily Dickinson. It has nothing to do with Aquinas, but it does make a good point. 
She says, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. To bright for arm in firm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to children with ease with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. What is she talking about? Well, for a Catholic, if you want to put this in theoretical terms, what she's talking about is called development of doctrine. And what that means, and what Catholics believe, is that in Jesus, there's the fullness of revelation. Nothing new is given after the death of the last apostle. And yet, our understanding of what Jesus told us develops over time. We can come to better and better understand what Jesus said, what Jesus meant. And that is what happens in development of doctrine. So, for instance, it, the Christian tradition holds us broadly. In the New Testament, it never says anywhere that Jesus is fully a human being and fully divine. But Christians believe that. That belief is a developed doctrine. That is to say, after reading the New Testament, the Christian church, in meditating on these mysteries, came to understand more and more fully the nature of who Jesus was. Or another example would be that Christians hold, both Catholics and Protestants, hold the idea that God is a trinity. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this is the Christian belief. But if you look in Scripture itself, it nowhere says God is a trinity. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the Christian church, in reading Scripture and meditating on it, when we believe, led by the Holy Spirit, we come to a greater understanding and a deeper appreciation of these truths. And so, just as there's development of doctrine for Catholics in terms of the Trinity, or in terms of the nature of Jesus as truly a human being and truly God, so too there's a development in moral teachings. And one of these moral teachings, for instance, would be the development in terms of the teaching of lending it interest. Now this development began actually before Luther and Calvin, according to historians. And so it, it is, should not be linked just with the, at least in my view, just with the, what's called the Protestant Reformation. Now, what was the change? How did this take place? Um, now, although charging interest on a loan is understood as wrong on the Thomistic account, we just went over, you can't buy and rent the same thing. Thomas did not believe that in all circumstances the lender must extend a loan and receive only the exact same amount in return. On Thomas's account, this is 13th century, over and above the amount of the loan, indemnity protection or insurance against loss or damage was permissible. Aquinas also says that the lender must be repaid not just for the principal, but also for expenses occurred in making the transaction, including what was lost in the transaction. For instance, if the borrow borrower pays back their principal late, the lender may ask for an additional return, since he was deprived of the use of money during a time which he could have made use of it. As Finnis notes, what is lost could therefore include money that could have been generated on a loan that had, not, had it, the loan not been made. Now Aquinas apparently considers this possibility and rejects it, rejects it. He says, but the lender cannot enter an agreement for compensation. Uh, through the fact that he makes no profit on his money, because he must not sell that which he has not yet and may be, pre may be prevented in many ways from having. Now, the truth of this last phrase, may be prevented in many ways from having, would seem to depend greatly on existing market conditions. In some markets, like the ones existing in Aquinas' day, the growth of an investment would be highly speculative. In other markets, like the ones existing in our own current society, the growth of an investment would be virtually assured. With the rise of such secure ways of investing money, the person who loans money loses with what reasonable assurance he could have made. In other words, Aquinas assumes money is a sterile, non-fungible commodity. But in contemporary money markets, money may be quite productive indeed. This is from John Finnis, a Thomistic scholar. He says, Aquinas' account of usury taken with his general theory of compensation, thus identifies principles, not rules made up by moralists or ecclesiastics, which enable us to see why in his era it was unjust for lenders to make a charge, however described in the nature of profit, but with the development of capital market, both for equities and bonds, it has become fair and reasonable to make precisely such a charge correlated with, which is not to say identical to, the general rate of return on equities. In other words, Aquinas' conclusions about lending and interest were adequate, given the financial assumptions and market conditions of his time, but must be adjusted for contemporary circumstances. 
in a similar way, in medieval times, to remove someone's heart is just simply to kill him. It is to murder. For today, but today, to cut off, um, to remove someone's heart may be part of a heart transplantation. For us today, to cut off someone's head is nothing other than to murder them. But it could be possible, centuries from now, that you could remove someone's head and it would not be murdering them. Then you could reattach it. It's possible that could happen. So both in ancient times and today, we would agree that murder is wrong. It's always wrong to intentionally kill an innocent person. And yet, what would count as murder would be one thing in the Middle Ages, something else today, and it may be something else in the future. So to remove someone's heart in the Middle Ages just is the same thing as murdering them. Removing, removing someone's heart today may not be just the same thing as murdering them if it's on an operating, operating table and you're putting in a new heart. And in the future, perhaps even cutting off someone's head won't be simply the same thing as murdering them if we have some way to reattach it in the future. Okay. Although there has been development in determining what constitutes usury, there has been no contradiction or radical rejection of previous teaching on the subject in the Catholic tradition. The greatest historian of usury in the Catholic tradition is a person named John Noonan, who's also a judge in the Ninth Circuit. And here's what he says. As far as dogma in the technical Catholic sense is concerned, there is only one dogma at stake. Dogma is not to be used loosely as synonymous with every papal rule or theological verdict. Dogma is defined, revealed doctrine, taught by the church at all times, in all places. Nothing here meets the test of dogma except this assertion, that usury, the act of taking profit on a loan without just title, is sinful. Even this dogma is not specifically formally defined by any pope or council. It is, however, taught by the tradition of the church, as witnessed by papal bulls and briefs, conciliar acts, and theological opinion. This dogmatic teaching remains unchanged. What is a just title? What is technically to be counted as a loan are matters of debate, positive law, and changing evolution. The development of these points is great, but the pure and narrow dogma is the same today as it was in 1200. Put another way, the Catholic Church maintains that usury is wrong, but does not hold and never did hold that all charging whatsoever of amounts beyond the principle is wrong. This continuity in condemning usury is reflected in the first universal compendium of Catholic teaching in over 400 years, called the Catechism of the Catholic Church written with the input of all the bishops of the church and published by the authority of John Paul II. Here's what the catechism says. It mentions usury in this condemnatory way. The acceptance by human society of murderous famines without any efforts to relieve them is a scandalous injustice and a grave offense. Those whose usurious and avaricious dealings lead to the hunger and death of their brethren in the human family indirectly commit homicide, which is imputable to them. Thus, the church retains the ancient patristic emphasis um, on using money only in such a way as is compatible with virtue and charity to the poor. Usury remains condemned in the Catholic tradition, but as Germain Grisey points out, the church has never taught that all charging of interest is wrong, but only that it is wrong to charge interest on a loan in virtue of the very making of the loan, rather than in virtue of some factor related to the loan which provides a fair basis for compensation. So what rate of interest should be charged on a loan? To whom should one loan? Should individuals in need be offered special opportunities, or as some would call it, a preferential option for the poor? These questions can only be answered in particular, and such questions can only be answered correctly by persons with infused charity and acquired prudence. The responsibility of the wealthy are great in the Catholic tradition. Indeed, the Christian tradition in the, as a whole, indeed, I'd say, these great religious monotheistic traditions as a whole. Jesus put the point this way. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the angels with him, he will sit on a glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all nations, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at the right hand, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, 
or thirsty and give you drink? And when were you a stranger or naked? When were you in prison? And when did we visit you? And the king will answer, Truly I say to you, as you did it for one of the least of these, you did it for me. Thank you very much for your attention.